Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious on this Friday, for October 20th, where we've got three shuttles we're going to talk about that are orbiting the Earth in this date in space history. We have got a popular astronaut's birthday today. At least this lady's very popular on the Space Coast and in Canada. And we're going to talk a little bit about how many days old is the moon? We want you to talk like an amateur astronomer. So, and they talk about the moon is, uh, say, 23 days old. And in your head, it should pop in. What does that look like in the sky? And where is it? So uh, we're going to talk about that and, and then put the cap on our solar eclipse that everybody, hopefully a lot of you enjoyed. A few places were raining in Ohio, uh, Tennessee, the southwest. I mean, the uh, Northwest were raining, so so a good way to go out today. I want to say hi to my friend and co-producer for now 400 and, I mean, 915 episodes, Marty Winkle. Good afternoon to you, sir. We haven't talked much today. Good afternoon, Mark. Hope you're doing well. Yep, I am. Uh, TGIF, the third week of the month, is always pretty busy with me liaisoning the board meetings and other things that I'm doing outside of Stay Curious. And as usual, we whip the show together here in about an uh, hour, hour and a half. Uh, and if I could have more time, it probably wouldn't come off as well. Those of you that know me, uh, we're pretty good under pressure, but uh, no pressure today. A beautiful day here on the Space Coast. Uh, we got some highlights of some great shuttle missions to tell you about. And though, We've got a, a bare-bones operation here, at least. This is our executive director, Karen Conklin's family, at the console, consoles here the other day. They're losing a little weight, aren't they, Marty? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's our way of saying that uh, we're going to have a Galaxy of Giving campaign November, start November 1st. Karen and myself and our whole staff have come up with another way to reward you for your giving and we know that lots of you at the end of the year want that tax deductible donation to your favorite charities and we want to get our share so we will have a hundred two fifty five hundred thousand dollar levels and some of those levels may in include a dinner with an astronaut and some neat swag that we will be offering beginning november 1st to raise some serious money every november we want to do this so stay curious about our galaxy of giving. And we got a couple other things in the works. Karen and I just finished up a press release for the November 11th Space Memorabilia Show that will be at our partner, the Beachside Hotel and Suites on Cocoa Beach. They're right beside Ron Johns, just a block away from the Atlantic Ocean. Great, uh, it's a great little family uh, Beachside Hotel is there in Ken Havocott's memorabilia will be the main sponsor. We have bid again auctions. We have computers advancing education and the mob, the museums of Brevard will be sponsoring this event. Tables will be $30. If you're local, contact me if you want to rent a table and sell some of your memorabilia. This will be a perfect time to get something for your space geek at Christmas time. And for those of you out of town, we want you to know that our ebay channel is up and running and we will have a slide for that put up next week to show you as selvin trotter who pinch hits for marty once in a while and i have resurrected our e ebay program here at the american space museum and already sold about 500 dollars worth of stuff marty and we got a lot of stuff we got so much stuff it's a problem we we really have to to uh, uh liquidate some of our uh, not our collection. This is stuff that comes through the door that we uh, assess. Uh, the process is someone comes in and says, my mom died. She worked at, as a contractor for NASA for 30 years. Here's her stuff. We go through it. Tell the people, honestly, you've got some, some autograph stuff here, some things that we want you to know is worth some money. Uh, but if you don't want it, we will either put it in our collection or we will sell it in the auction if it's worth $200 or more. And the other stuff goes to eBay. We've got just boxes and boxes of a lot of paperwork that we hate to just throw away. So we're going to be offering it by the 
the pound almost uh, and his, some of his memorabilia are the, the newspaper not the newspapers as much as the trade magazines and so many nasa and contractor brochures of payload informations and missions and it doesn't stop there folks the american space museum and the producers of this searching for skylab movie it is an awesome documentary of skylab we are going to be hosting on November 16th at 11 a.m. an autograph session. That's right, with Jack Lausma on the left and Rusty Schweikert on the right. Jack, of course, was on the Skylab 2, the second crewed mission. Lausma was, or Schweikert was not. He was a backup on those missions. Of course, Rusty was the Apollo 9 uh, lunar module pilot, and Marty's met him and gotten his autograph quite a few times. I believe you have Marty. You met Rusty. Yeah, I've met Rusty a few times yep. since Apollo days. I met him during Apollo also, but more recently during our. I think last time I saw him was our Apollo 11 reunion, 50 year reunion. Okay, yeah, great. And so we're looking forward to having them in our building. Jack Lawson has been here, good friend of our godfather, Charlie Mars. Uh, but November 16th, Marty, is the launch of the last crewed mission to Skylab. Uh, and uh, so we're going to be celebrating that on a historic day, 11 to about 1230. They're going to have an autograph session. Then they're going to have a lunch we're going to provide here and then be at Kennedy Space Center at three o'clock for an IMAX theater showing of Searching for Skylab. And then I believe they're going to have a meet and greet and autograph session out there. Yes, Marty, have you seen advertising for this? Yeah, is there an entry fee? I had a few people ask me that question. Is there an entry fee? Don't know yet because oh, uh, here at the museum there will there be the normal ten dollars adult, eight dollar military seniors and kids, uh, uh, teenagers are five bucks, uh, and they're trying to figure out now whether to charge for autographs, that sort of thing. So uh, thanks for the question. We just found out about this yesterday as the good producers of Skylab. Uh, have been in touch with Anita Truex, our great staff member here that, that uh, gets all the beautiful things in our uh, our merchandise uh, shop. And she's also the office manager of uh, booking a lot of things here, including the Harvest Host. If you're a Harvest Hoster, RVer, you can park here for free and enjoy our museum. And Anita will take care of that. So we're just amazed that this fell into our lap and uh we're looking forward to this and we'll be promoting the heck out of that uh still a fluid thing here we want to thank uh jay uh jelaine spears jelaine spears you did an awesome job telling your story as a quality assurance uh technician or quality assurance uh specialist uh, what specialist specialist quality assurance specialist not a quality control specialist and she told us the difference she did a great job talking about a really interesting area of the shuttle era and she was one of the women that broke the, some of the glass ceilings as she ascended up the ranks with her knowledge uh in in uh in nasa uh so we've uh, had a great show with her you can check that out also mr jay honeycutt was on uh, Wednesday, though we had our computer crash. There's a good uh, 28 minutes of the former director of Kennedy Space Center sharing about his early days in his 20s when he was a, they, some people say evil and some say talented, simulation operator training the flight crew, crew operators and the flight crews. Question, Marty, or comment? you got a question from Cynthia Rossi. Is the preview open at KSC for everyone to view? Is what open for everyone? The preview. I think she's, she's talking we about We don't know the... anything about the Kennedy Space Center side of that right now, Cynthia. Uh, we're going to find out about that. In fact, uh, we were notified about this yesterday, and I sent out an email to the producers whose names I don't have in front of me, a husband and wife, uh, uh, Alexandria is the woman, uh, so we will find out about that uh, if there's a fee. Usually, we would guess these things are season ticket holders are allowed there. And then, of course, anyone that goes in, this is sort of a bonus day thing there. So uh, like with the um, uh, Million Miles Away movie of Jose Hernandez, that was 
uh, not an extra uh, ticket item. But this could be with two legendary astronauts. So we'll be telling more about that. Uh, Cynthia Rossi, you see something on uh, the uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, uh, application. Please let us know. Hey, we thought we'd throw this in as I was researching today. This uh, Marty says I look pretty good there. Uh, this is three years ago, folks, on October 20th, as the whole world was quarantined with uh, this horrible COVID pandemic where thousands of people lost their lives. Uh, Marty, I am covering up there the, the glass of tang that I have there. If I minimize, you can see I got a glass of tang there. This was our old set, and we were quite proud of what we did with so little. Uh, I was forever putting things in the back like telescopes, and that's one of our trade show uh, posters that we use. Uh, Stay Curious, American Space Museum labeled all over the place. So, uh, And, of course, our Stay Curious masks, which I saved one in pristine condition for that time capsule when we put that together, Marty, for this museum. But... Uh, God bless everybody. Think back three years ago. I know you don't want to. It's like a blink. It's just, just like you don't even want to think about it. Uh, no football in the stands. No, uh, the NBA basketball season was over here in, in uh, uh, Orlando. At their, that's where everybody played their games on this area of the country. And so, uh, but we got through it, and we were stronger and a better country for it. And uh, but uh, we don't ever want to forget about that. And, uh, you know, about it was about four years ago, we were talking on this show about how silly it might be to have had um, uh, moon germs. Good God, moon germs can't hurt the whole world. That's a silly thing. Why are those astronauts wearing those garments, you know, when they got out of the spaceship? At least the first uh, three moon landers did uh, missions. And uh, here we see, yes, one little germ can infect an entire planet. So it's something to think about. Well, let's get to our birthday girl here, Marty, not Jaylene. But happy birthday. That, of course, is the astronaut pin. Happy birthday to Julie Payette, vice shuttle flyer, Canadian Julie Payette was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. She is 60 years old today. She is certainly does not look her age, and there I am. We're going to gush all over here, Marty. You can say what you want on that UCAC family microphone because we all found Julie to be quite an enjoyable and refreshing visitor at the astronaut encounter here at Kennedy Space Center. She not only spent 25 days in space on STS-96 in 1999 and STS-27 in uh, 2009, but she, uh, well, let me get that up there. There she is at the astronaut encounter that's at the, uh, the uh, merchandise center at Kenny Visitors Complex. And then this is the noon signing session. And then at 4 o'clock, they're over underneath Atlantis. So there's Karen Conk on our executive director shaking hands with the former governor general of Canada. She was a, in a position that uh, uh, was, uh, she led the, the constitutional and ceremonial duties of Queen Elizabeth II. She was referred to as Her Excellency or Her Right Honorable Julie Payton. Uh, and Marty, I think she just enjoyed everybody calling her Julie. She, We really had a blast with her. There you are, my friend, getting uh, some things autographed there. Why don't you give a comment about this lady, how she, uh, your impression of her. You know, I found her extremely friendly, very open and just very jovial. When she gave her talk during the encounter, she was animated. She got the uh, audience uh, I don't say captivated. They kept them, you know, she would ask questions. She, she was just outstanding. Really enjoyed listening to her. Thank you for your comments. There's Mark Smith, who I saw out there yesterday. Nick uh, Thomas has been on vacation. Mark is the other one of the other astronaut wranglers out there. Uh, Hazel's hidden behind there, Marty. She'll be glad about that. But there's Anita Truex. We always love bragging about our staff and knowing more than Anita here, very behind the scenes, and uh, we love her, and we couldn't do without her here. So 
uh, just another wonderful senior citizen that uh, is, is really uh, never wants to quit working and taking care of there with Julie there. And uh, here she is in her role as governor general there. Payette is fluent in French and English, and she can converse in Spanish, Italian, Russian, and German. And you all know I have trouble with English, okay? She plays the piano, but get, get this. She is an opera singer. She has sung with the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, the Switzerland uh, Vocal uh, Ensemble, and a Tafel Music Tafel Music Baroque Orchestra in Toronto. She is quite the songbird. And I looked up so her singing on uh, YouTube. You close your eyes, you can't believe, you know, this, 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 this woman is, you know, doing this. Uh, she's really special. Uh, so, uh, and uh, she was up there at the Kibo Japanese Observatory. She was chief astronaut for the Canadian Space Agency for seven years up there. So, uh, you can tell we can't get enough of Julie Payette. And she will be out at the Space Center October 28th through Halloween Day. Tuesday, October 31st. You better believe it. I'm going to be out there a couple times to see her. We got some cool things for her to autograph. And we might just take her something out there to tell her we celebrated your 60th birthday, Julie Payette, as a truly a wonderful Canadian astronaut and a politician up there. So, all right, let's get into a little bit about the shuttles of the month of, of October. And, uh, I had a cheat sheet here that probably didn't bring with me, Marty. Where was that thing? We had 58 astronauts uh, in October. Uh, 12 missions, okay. Uh, 70 astronauts were launched in the month of uh, October. 16 of them women. Uh, several astronauts had two missions in October. That would be uh, Bill MacArthur. We just were talking to Bill MacArthur the other day, Marty. Uh, he had 58 and 92. Uh, Shannon Lucid, we're going to talk about her back-to-back -back missions. STS 34 and 58 launched on the same day, October 18th, right there in the middle. We'll be talking about those. And Bill Shepard was on 58 and 41. And later in the month, next week, we better start talking about it because it's the 20th of the month. Pam Bo, Pam Melroy was commander of STS-120 and 112, and her second pilot duty was STS-92, all in the month of October. So we'll feature Pam Melroy, who is the assistant director, or deputy director, they call it, of NASA, beneath Mr. Bill Nelson. So uh, a lot of interesting missions, as always, in the in every month. Uh, we've got uh, OV-103, uh, uh, Discovery flew four times, uh, three times for 102 uh, 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 and 104 Atlantis and uh, Columbia. Challenger flew twice uh, nine, uh, in the, the month, and that's what I have the CH uh, there. That's what the letter is on my graph here. Uh, so Columbia flew twice, and no flights for Endeavor. Uh, that they're starting to really get that facility uh, in uh, California built to put it up on a stack. So uh, we'll talk about these missions here. Got a couple of them here. Let's kick it off with uh, some a little bit of trivia. Marty, everybody knows, or if you're a good space geek, you should know, that the first two shuttles flew with a white tank. There is the launch of STS-1. Okay. And STS-2. Or wait a minute. Do I have it backwards, Marty? Which one is STS-1 and STS-2? And Marty, would you mind telling why they took the white off of there, the paint, and it turned uh, orange? Because you were working on the shuttle main engines for 30 years. Yeah, there were 600 pounds of paint to paint the external tank. And if you don't put the paint on a tank, you can put that into payload. So that was the reason. Okay, thank you, Marty. Well, do you know how you can tell apart STS-1 from STS-2? No, afraid not, Mark. Well, Tom Usiak told me that because Tom Usiak took this picture of STS-2 in November 
uh, uh, 1981, and we're going to be talking about that. So November 12th launch, and then this is STS-1 on April 12th, 1981. And Marty, I forgot to cue you on this, but would you get your little circle or arrow out and go to the very top of the external tank? Because Tommy Usiak told me that look at the external tank up there. What do you see? I see a, a black little line, a little band around that that is not there on STS-2. And indeed, that is a visual difference. You see it now. The black line going around the top of the e external tank is not there on STS-2. And therefore, you folks watching today and staying curious can win a good trivia contest. Maybe a beer, maybe a five bucks, maybe a order of fries if you're like me. So thank you, Tommy Usiak, for passing that on to me. Uh, we've always wondered about that. And uh, uh, he actually helped us out by by explaining that we had something in the auction that was identified as STS-1, and yet it was STS-2 because it had the, the ring around. It didn't have the ring around the collar, all right? Ring around the collar is one, no ring, clean is two. Let's get to a couple crews here real quick as we're staying curious. There is STS-34. Don Williams, who passed away, was the pilot, and Mike McCulley, his one and only space flight. Uh, this is William's second and last mission, so he was a one-time pilot and then a commander. McCulley didn't stick around because he was the first pilot of a class of seven to fly, and he was not going to be a commander, he said. He would took him three or four years to fly again, and he went into management and become a real beloved leader of the United Space Alliance. I think he worked for Lockheed for a while, That and Mike and uh, is the tall one on the the far right, and Don Williams is on the left. Then left to right, you got Shannon Lucid making her second of five flights. Uh, and Chang Diaz, Franklin Chang Diaz, his second of seven flights, record seven with Jerry uh, uh, Voss. And then you've got uh, Ellen Baker, her first of three flights there. Two women, uh, three men. Uh, that that uh, uh, Those guys had to keep that toilet clean, Marty. You know that. There's one of the pretty pictures I love of the shuttle era. Uh, there's uh, Don Williams there, Mike McCulley on the left. Uh, the left side seat is the commander's seat, and the right side is the pilot. But the commander is the pilot. They just didn't want to call him pilot and co-pilot. Uh, and the commander uh, is the commander. So, uh, And Mike McCulley, thank you for all that you've done to help our museum throughout the years. Also, I wanted to point out there, not there's only four seats up there, so it looks like Ellen is standing up. She would have uh, rode to space alone down in the, the, the mid-deck, and uh, I bet she switched with Shannon Lucid maybe on the ride back. That was usually the case with five people or six. Oh there, oh, there we go back there. We're going the wrong way, Peach Fuzz. Oh, let's talk a little bit about something that I enjoy sharing, a little book knowledge about the wonderful patches that the astronaut crews figure out. Well, the insignia that this crew figured out was the triangular shape of STS-34 crew patch represents forward motion and the entering of new frontiers of science, engineering, and technology, sort of the tip of a spear there, or arrowhead. The Galileo spacecraft overlaying the orbiter symbolizes the joining together of both manned and unmanned space programs in order to maximize the capabilities of each. Expansion of our knowledge of the solar system and other worlds, leading to a better understanding of our own planet, is indicated by the sunrise expanding across the Earth's horizon. In the distance is Jupiter, a unique and unknown world, awaiting arrival of Galileo to help unlock its secrets. Meanwhile, the space shuttle remains in Earth orbit, continuing to explore the near-Earth environment. This 1989 mission was very important to astronomy as Galileo went to Jupiter, started orbiting about six months later, and for 10 or 12 years orbited Jupiter and got near its moons. Over three dozen moons looked at very close, including the giant four moons all big, that Galileo the uh, Italian astronomer discovered in 1609. 
So uh, what a mission this was. And uh, uh, there is the Galileo spacecraft in the payload bay of uh of what of atlantis uh and uh this was um, a quick five-day mission as they didn't have much science planned and in 1989 they wanted to get these spacecraft up and out and going on there so well now let's look at sts uh 58 launched the same day october 18th uh, but four years uh, after atlantis and sts 34 this was columbia and the crew there was launched uh, at 10.53 a.m. Mr. John Blaha is the commander. He's right in the back, standing up on the left. Richard Searfoss, who's passed away, was the pilot. He's seated on the hand, right there above my hand. Uh, you had Rhea Seddon, the payload commander. She's the blonde in the middle. And look at uh, Shannon Lucid on her uh, third mission to space right there she would then go to the international she would go to the russian mir space station uh, eventually on her uh, four missions uh, there we got bill MacArthur that we talked about bill is standing up in the back center there really a great guy isn't he marty he loves talking to, to you and doing autographs and uh, uh, really enjoy him is he a marine no i think so yeah, that's why he's no, a nice... No, 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 he's... Uh, okay. I think it's Ken Cameron I'm thinking of. Okay, but, uh, yeah. Look it up. Bill's a good guy. David Wolf, who's also going to be on the Mir Space Station's right there. They, uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, Marty Fetman, payload specialist. Nobody knows about Marty Fetman right there, uh, behind Sirfoss and Rhea Seddon, who's married to astronaut Hoot Gibson. Uh, so, uh, but he was a one-and-done payload specialist. And as we've learned, payload specialists do not get the astronaut pin. All right. They are contracted by a company uh, to take up their, uh, their their spacecraft or their experiment. So, uh, And that's right. We've got Bill MacArthur as an Army man. All right. Our, uh, uh, Bill MacArthur has done a lot of interesting missions up there, too. So... So this mission highlight of, uh, of uh, 58, uh, it had a space lab science mission in it, SL2, 14 experiments. That's why Fetman was there, okay, and um, studied weightlessness. Uh, this was uh, Shannon Luce's fourth flight. That's right, she'd already been on the, the Mir space station. And there's their patch, and let's read the patch here as we enjoy a little bit of artwork and uh, art in STEAM education here on Stay Curious Today. The STS-58 crew patch shows Columbia in orbit around Earth with a space lab module in its payload bay. The space lab and the lettering Space Lab Life Science 2 highlight the primary mission of the second space shuttle flight dedicated to life science research. That's us, folks. How do humans live in space? An extended duration orbiter called EDO support pallet is shown in the aft payload bay, stressing the scheduled two-week duration of this longest space shuttle mission to date. And Mikey Haddad's going to be on next week talking about the German uh, space lab. And he's talked to us about these these extended mission uh, support, uh, oxygen, and so forth that has to be added. In sort of the hexagonal shape of the patch depicts the carbon ring, a molecule common to all living organisms. Encircling the inner border of the patch is a double helix nebula of DNA, representing the genetic basis of life. Its yellow background is the color of the sun, the energy source for all life on Earth. Both medical and veterinary caduces are shown to represent the STS-58 life experiments. Finally, the position of the spacecraft in orbit about the Earth with the United States in the background symbolizes the ongoing support of the American people for scientific research intended to benefit all mankind. This patch was, des was designed by the STS-58 crew. Uh, so a lot of interesting information in there uh, that you wouldn't know if you weren't staying curious with us today. 
And here is the space lab in the payload bay, the very same space lab that was lost in Columbia. Uh, this was, a, uh, of course, another Columbia mission. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the space lab was, was sort of part of, of Columbia. It fit well in there, and everyone was acclimated to, to using it there. Uh, so when I saw this picture, I was looking for a picture in space of SCS-73, and I was a little confused because SCS-73 is another space lab mission, okay? Uh, they, it, instead of life science lab, though, they this was the second flight of the United States Microgravity Laboratory, which was the same module outfitted with different canisters of, of experiments. And uh, let's look at the crew here in space. A couple of our favorites there, Marty. You see to the left of, uh, of the lower end there, there is Kathy Thornton on her fourth of four flights. We have met that young lady and celebrated her birthday on August 17th this year when she was here at the Space Center. And we have her blue uh, flight suit on a mannequin. That's her height in our our women's gallery, we, we proudly have that here. Uh, in the middle is uh, Michael Lopez Allegra, uh, who was the commander of a, uh, this was his uh, first of three flights, and then he flew on a um, Axiom flight and, uh, as a private uh, astronaut, and he's going back up to a second Axiom flight beginning of the year, Marty. Uh, and uh, so uh, very experienced, and he works with Axiom, as does Peggy Whitson, uh, the, the most uh, flown female uh, in America. Let's see, you got Ken Bowersox there, his third of five flights. He's the commander right there. And then we got Romo, Kent Rominger. He's got the mustache up there in the upper right. Rominger, this is his first of five as a pilot, and then he was a commander three times after being a pilot twice. Marty, he's got the record for the most time spent in a space shuttle, 67 days. Nobody has spent more time in a shuttle than he did, okay, uh, going up and back on his five flights. Part of it was because this set the record not only for scrubs at six, but it was also the longest flight at almost 16 days. All right. And then it was eclipsed by another one. I think Tom Jones was on. Um, we've not, uh, let's see, we've got, uh, we talked about mustachioed Ken Bowersox there. You got Fred Leslie and Albert Sacco are the two men. Sacco's up at the top. All right. He's a Brooklyn man. And, uh, uh, and then the other lady is Katie Coleman. And Katie Coleman, her first of two flights, Katie is on Facebook a lot. Maybe you're a friend of Katie Coleman. She likes sharing things that she's doing uh, as an astronaut. And uh, she's got uh, uh, heritage of, uh, she took flutes to space. And she's got Irish heritage, I believe. So that's our crew there. We love telling you about them in detail because they're in your communities right now doing things to advance uh, the human population's knowledge of being in space, only 606 human beings can say they orbited the Earth. That's why we feel and stay curious. It's important that you get to know them all a little bit. And you're going to be hearing more about L.A. there, Jose uh, uh, Allegra, uh, as uh, Lopez Allegra, L.A., her uh, Michael Lopez Allegra, that's his name, not Jose. I got Jose Hernandez on the brain, Marty. Uh, as he'll be going to space for Axiom, and maybe he'll go a third time for Axiom to start building the space station edition that they're going to put up there starting next year. Well, let's look at their patch. Oh, by the way, like I said, here's why I got confused. Marty picked this beautiful picture, and it looked the same as STS-58 to me, and I double-checked it, but no. Uh, that it looks the same with the OM pods for reentry and maneuvering and the vertical stabilizer there to shuttle. Let's go back to, uh, yeah, that's what I was saying there. Let's look at their patch here for one last patch look on Stay Curious. The crew patch of STS-73, the second flight of the U.S. Microgravity Lab, depicts the Space Shuttle Columbia in the vastness of space. In the foreground are the classic 
re regular polyhedrons that were investigated by Plato in later Euclid uh, a long, long time ago, 2,000 years ago. The Pythagoreans were also fascinated by the symmetrical three-dimensional objects whose sides are the same regular polygon. The tetrahedron, the cube, and the octahedron, and the icosahedron were each associated with the natural elements of that time. And there you see them there on the bottom. Fire on this mission, combustion science. Earth, the second natural element. Crystallography is what they're going to study. Air and water was fluid physics. An additional icon shown as the infinity symbol was added to further convey the discipline of fluid mechanics. The shape of the emblem represents a fifth polyhedron, a dodecahedron, which the Pythagoreans thought corresponded to a fifth element that represented the cosmos. So there you have it. Pretty cool. All those Easter eggs in there. You got stars, and you would think that's the cupola up there, but nope, that's a, a, a deco decahedron in there. So, well, I hope that you've all enjoyed a little bit of knowledge of our wonderful shuttles of the month of October. We'll conclude the other missions that we have as this we're up to mission number seven, uh, eight. We've got eight of the 12, we have four more to go. And we've got all next week to do it on Stay Curious. Well, as we go out on Stay Curious today, I want you to get some some uh, little moonshine as we got the moon in the in the sky. This is I encourage you to download this evening sky map, courtesy of SkyMaps.com. They encourage everyone to use this freely for education uses. That band, that blue band, is the Milky Way, and though the moon is getting bright. It is still, uh, well, how many days old is the moon? Well, we're going to tell you to speak like an astronomer here in just a minute. And we'll figure out how many days the moon is as we look at it, at it tonight. But it, as it gets brighter towards full moon, uh, you're not going to see the Milky Way. But uh, you got the planets of Saturn and moon uh, and, and Jupiter pointed out here. And this is a neat little download. On the left are the days of the, the month. It says the 22nd, the Orion meteor shower peaks, debris from the field of Halley's Comet. Uh, but the moon will be pretty bright, and you won't be able to see it then. Uh, so let's, uh, how old is the moon to speak like an, an astronomer? Or an amateur astronomer? When I talked to my amateur astronomer buddies at the Brevard Astronomical Society, I said, gee, the moon's, uh, uh, you know, 13 days old, you know, there's too much moonlight out there. Well, as you can see, a 14-day-old moon is full moon. New moon is zero, all right? The first day after new moon is one day old. New moon is when we had the eclipse of the sun. Some of you had a, t a total annual eclipse out in the southwest of America. Others of us, like us, saw the Pac-Man eclipse, and we're going to go out with uh, some memories of that. So the moon right now, if it's going to be first quarter moon on Saturday, that's right. It's six days old today. There's a photo I took of what the moon will look like tonight. And then, uh, so Saturday will be first quarter. So that means seven days later, the 14-day-old moon is a full moon next Saturday. You're going to have a crazy full moon. Halloween parties going on. Halloween will be Tuesday. The moon will still be rising about uh, 9 o'clock at night, so some of you late Halloweeners will see the moon in the night sky, a full moon. There's my map there. So now you can speak like an amateur astronomer. That's a six-day-old moon, Marty. And this moon is how many days old? Well, it's after a first quarter moon, and it's before the full moon. First quarter moon is seven days old. Full moon is 14 Yep, this is about a 10-day-old moon, maybe 11 days old. And if I say 11 days old, I know it's going to be what we call a gibbous. This phase of the moon is called a gibbous. It's going to be real bright in the sky. It's going to be up almost all night. So it's not a good night to see the Andromeda galaxy or the Ring Nebula or any of the star clusters like Messier 13 and Hercules. They'll be washed out by the moonshine. 
And I love looking at the moon and seeing the woman in the moon that you can outline. I know Marty's bemused by this. Uh, the moon's tilted a little bit like that on there, but you can make believe that you see anything on the moon because no one owns the original. You can see and do anything you want with the moon, just like I did there. Draw a profile of a woman on it. And there's the beautiful full moon over one of our natural preserves here on Merritt Island. Uh, and we will all be enjoying that moon dance next week. So we'll probably be talking a little bit about some moon lore. Don't want to burn you out with it, but Artemis is going to the moon, they say. <laughs> and uh, fingers crossed. And the moon is such an influence on our tides, the human physiology, animal behavior. So it's always a good topic. And you can't know enough about the moon and you can't get enough moonshine. And as you're out looking at the moon, you're going to see a bright star, Marty. I don't know if you've noticed a bright star looking to the east uh, at about 8 o'clock when it gets dark. That is not a star. That's the planet Saturn. And this is how it looks right now. Its rings are closing up a little bit. We'll explain that one day. Uh, they're going to be edge on, actually, in a couple years and then open up again. But you see Saturn, and then an hour later, I guarantee you go outside and look to the east where the sun rises, folks. At 10, 11 o'clock at night, you're going to go, what is that bright star? That is the planet Jupiter. Taken through the same telescope, see how the rings are about as the entire globe of Jupiter is there. So get out and get you a little light there. There you see the red spot at the bottom of these cloud bands that we're looking at on Jupiter and Saturn. We want to thank everyone again and remind you what a phenomenon it was to have a solar eclipse. Uh, these only happen uh, over where you live. You're lucky to see you're lucky to see 10 a lifetime, okay? Uh, know that Bill Whiting probably saw it. Don't know if Bill saw it or not. Is Bill back in town? Yeah. Supposed to come Thursday. Yeah, Bill got us. back, I think, today. And I think it was cloudy up in Michigan. I think Dave Stang mentioned that yesterday, that the day that was it was too cloudy. Thanks, Marty. Cynthia Rossi's watching. Doug Forrest, I got something to show you here in just a minute. He's a pencil artist and, and uh, uh, works in the industry, uh, entertainment industry in Los Angeles. Robert Law said he was feeling a little under the weather, so get you a double hot toddy there brother up there in Dundee, Scotland, and uh, get well. Carlton Bailey, glad you're there. And Marina is in Dnipro, Ukraine. God bless you, Marina. You've watched our show time and time again, and you're watching it from the Ukraine. And our thoughts and prayers are with your safety and everybody. And Mario Sergio is in Brazil. Awesome, Margio. I'm a Formula One fan. We're racing in Austin this weekend, Austin, Texas, but I would love to go to Brazil to the Formula One race they have there in a week. So send me a ticket, Mario. <laughs> I'll take the day off. Well, here we are out at the Veterans Memorial on Merritt Island, Brevard Astronomical Society. Thank you, Roger Scruggs, for that picture. And thank you, Mark Usiak for sharing your picture of your annual eclipse. Mark also did a great show on the starship out there at Boca Chica on the Gulf of, of Mexico and Texas. You can look at that show. And uh, Mark, uh, another Mark. We got three Marks here, Rod. I didn't think about that. Uh, uh, this is Mark um, Poole. And Mark Poole took combined a photo he took of the moon, made it black of the full moon, and superimposed it. You could not see any detail on the moon, at least I couldn't. Uh, uh, and then you had these uh, different sunspots for the dark areas. That the moon, the Pac-Man moon, was swallowing up, and one is swallowed up here on Mark's picture. I took this picture, and it kept getting deeper, and it went over and swallowed up the other one. And uh, as I always say, no one owns the original. I took a photograph, but I'm getting away from photography because everybody's doing that. I've always enjoyed pencil sketching. So I sketched my impressions of the sun and the moon and the edge with its lumpiness gobbling up those craters. Those are not craters, those sunspots on the sun. And it ended up looking like this. So... Uh, a little uh, over-dramatization, a little bit about how those sunspots look like, but I'm the artist. I can do what I want. And you may critique that, Mr. 
uh, Doug up there, uh, Doug Forrest, uh, who uh, has encouraged me to just keep drawing. So I do. Well, everybody, we hope that you can get around to helping us out a little bit. Uh, that uh, The Con Con Conklin family of Karens really needs some help there. But uh, So uh, keep in mind we're going to have a galaxy of giving. And keep in mind that we certainly do appreciate you spending your time watching us on Stay Curious today. Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs job. We actually had the computer crash Wednesday on Mr. J. Honeycutt. The program is still worth watching. We're going to do a part two with that gentleman. I've been in touch with him already. Great job, Marty. We have anything to button up over there? Um, no, we're good. Uh, anyway, Space, Space Nerd just uh, uh, said great drawing, and so did uh, Doug Forrest. Oh, well, thank you, Doug. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was there. Space Nerd and Doug Forrest. Oh, Space Nerd. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, like you said, it's uh, if, if you have a passion, just do it. Don't uh, be self-conscious about what people think, particularly when it comes to uh, astronomy and the stars. Uh, we all we always say there's no silly questions in astronomy or talking about stargazing, though I've heard a lot of silly ones that you will never be judged or ridiculed or talked down to by any of the astronomy brothers and sisters I know. We love the passion. We love sharing it. And we love you all for staying curious with us. So, Marty, again, thanks a lot. Hope you have a great weekend. I got one other thing to say. Beat Penn State, okay? My Buckeyes have got to beat Penn State. That's the game of the weekend. We'll worry about you, that team up north some other time, all right? Until then, I'm Mark Marquez saying thank you for supporting our American Space Museum, your number one nonprofit. And I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Go Buckeyes.